The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting. For creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast. For the stories. I don't think anybody inside of China or outside of China thought that he would be able to move so swiftly to shift away from the kind of collective leadership that had developed over the previous uh, 15 years or so to a much more centralized, rigid system focused around the general secretary as the key leader or as the core. And that, I think, took everybody by surprise. And also his illiberal attitude. His father was known as a very liberal figure and had been responsible for many of the progressive reforms in the south of China. Xi himself had worked in uh, provinces along the Chinese coast, which uh, had a much uh, greater role for private business, for example. And yet when he took power, he didn't move in a liberal direction. He moved back in a much more conservative direction. And I think it was because of his fear that unless there was that unified, tough, disciplined party with a key leader, uh, things could slip very quickly out of control. I'm Bryce Klen, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, Tuesday, September 7th, 2021. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. To get more insight into the workings of the CCP, I sat down with Tony Sage, the director of the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation and the Dae Wu Professor of International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. Professor Sage is the author of the new book, From Rebel to Ruler, 100 Years of the Chinese Communist Party. We talked about a range of subjects, tracing the 13 original leaders of the CCP to President Xi Jinping's current policies. It's the Lawfare Podcast, September 7th, Tony Sage on 100 Years of the CCP. Tony, thank you so much for joining me. I want to start with a very basic question. When we talk about the Chinese Communist Party or the CCP at the current moment, how large is the organization? Give us an outline of its basic structure and a rough estimate of the number of its members. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Well, it's a big beast, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, Current numbers say it has about 95 million uh, members. And that means that it's only, though, about 6% of the population. But, of course, its members control all the key positions at the national level and at the local levels. Essentially, its structure is in a pyramid shape. So you have grassroots organizations at the bottom, uh, working in the streets, working in the farms, uh, operating in the factories. And then it slowly builds up till you get to the central committee members, who will meet uh, once a year in Beijing, and above that, the Politburo and the Standing Committee of the Politburo. So it's a very hierarchical organization. And like many hierarchical organizations, it cedes most power to those at the top of that pyramid. And in the current period of time, of course, that's the General Secretary Xi Jinping. So 90 million members. Take us back 100 years to the 13 original founders of the CCP. Who were they and what experiences had they lived through that led them to believe that communism was the answer to China's problems at that moment in 1921? Yeah, they represented 53 members. Uh, I can't think they would ever imagined that they would be in the position they're in today. And those who attended that first party congress were essentially a group of what one might term intellectuals who had become seriously disillusioned with developments in China that following the collapse of the dynasty a decade earlier, they'd had hopes, expectations that China might move in a more progressive, 
and perhaps even more democratic direction. But slowly but surely, uh, they became frustrated with what they saw as the dithering and the warlord politics around them and felt that change really had to come in a total way, that what was needed in China was a brand new system uh, which could ally uh, with Soviet Russia and would get rid of the foreigners, would eradicate private business, and would put the party and ultimately the stateless society in control. Having said that, though, it's important to remember that only two of those original 13 Chinese members stuck with the Chinese Communist Party all the way through 1949. And in fact, at the First Party Congress, there was a wide range of different views expressed. Uh, The majority took a very hard, very orthodox uh, Marxist line. It included, uh, for example, uh, no compromise with the yellow intellectuals and the bourgeois class, somewhat ironic given that they were all intellectuals themselves, and it pledged themselves to lead the working class onto the dictatorship of the proletariat. Others said, yeah, well, you know, wait a minute, Uh, maybe we need to think about this a bit more. Maybe we should look at uh, social democracy as an alternative. And so they were essentially a group of people who were very disaffected with the inheritance that had come to them, but not all of them were certain about the way forward. So one thing that you talk a lot about in the book is this sort of difference in this delineation between the Communist Party trying to appeal to the peasantry and the working class. I was wondering if you could just give us a sense of that debate in the the 20s and 30s in particular. Well, when the party founded, it was established, it took a very traditional stance that the revolution was going to be based uh, on the working class, of which, of course, there were not many in China at that time. It was overwhelmingly a rural country uh, made up of uh, small peasant farmers, landlords, and so forth. And so through much of the 20s, it tried to focus its activities on labor agitation, organizing amidst uh, the working class. Now, someone who was at the First Party Congress, actually a Dutchman, Hank Snaefleet, thought that that was uh, not a very effective policy given the weakness of the working class. And he suggested that a broader coalition would be necessary with the fledgling nationalist movement, which was developing in the South. And he encouraged Communist Party members, or in fact enforced that Communist Party members, should join that nationalist movement as individuals. And for a while that was very successful. The party began to expand quite rapidly. But it was becoming clear that a strategy based on mobilizing the working class to take power was not going to be effective. And that was destroyed as a vision in 1927 when its nationalist partners turned on the communists in Shanghai and slaughtered many of them. Now, some of the early Communist Party leaders, including Mao Zedong, had been uh, recognizing the importance and the role of the peasantry. But if you look at the documentation through the 20s, indeed even through the 1930s, It still stressed that it was really a party made up of advanced elements of the proletariat. But the defeat of the urban movement in 1927 really meant that they had no choice but to settle in the countryside. Essentially, nationalist forces uh, drove them into the barren hills in various areas of China, where they had to establish uh, base areas rooted in the countryside. And that led them to pay more attention to questions that would affect the peasantry and peasant livelihood. And so you see increasingly, although the rhetoric keeps talking about the proletariat, the proletarian revolution, it becomes an armed force which is based in the countryside and increasingly reliant on peasant support to keep it alive and to keep it going. So I want to fast forward a little bit. As you mentioned there, the CCP survived several low points, almost being completely exterminated during the the 20s and 30s. During the 40s, while China was both trying to repel the Japanese invasion and and the CCP was at least somewhat at, at a civil war, you write that building a coherent party and uniting sort of the ideologically diverse coalition that was the CCP at that point was a major challenge 
why was Mao Zedong uniquely positioned to unite the party during that time period? And what characteristics did he possess? Yes, what was happening was that, as you said, the Chinese Communist Party had almost been exterminated on a number of different occasions. It was now hunkered down in a scattered number of what were called base areas where it had territorial control. But really, it was uh, an amalgam of all kinds of different ideas, different people who were party members without any cohesive ideology or really cohesive plan of action at that point. So, for example, uh, a number of uh, urban liberals, uh, intellectuals, who'd fled either uh, from Japanese invasion or from the nationalists had found themselves uh, in these base areas. And they were sympathetic, I guess, towards left-wing causes, but they didn't know anything about Marxism. Uh, They didn't really know what the Chinese Communist Party stood for. And so I think Mao had concluded that if they were to survive, organization was at the core. And was at the core of organization was a strong, disciplined party that would follow uh, a coherent set of beliefs. And whatever else Mao was, and he was many things, he was also a magnificent storyteller. And he began to tell a story, I think, uh, of his own rise to power and the existence of the Chinese Communist Party that made sense to many of those who'd fled to those base areas. So, for example, he talked about the long arc of history, the humiliation of China, uh, the exploitation of the foreigners, the exploitation of the landlords. And I think some of those who came with their own individual stories uh, began to think, oh, okay, this wasn't just me this was happened to. This was a bigger force of history uh, that meant that I finished up here. And so that was compelling, I think, to many, but not to everyone. And that is an important side of that to remember, that while some might have been persuaded, others were coerced uh, to accept the new line, uh, which was emanating from Mao and his closest supporters, and woe betide those who didn't accept that new definition of what the Communist Party stood for and what it meant in terms of looking forward towards the future. And that sort of control over who is correctly analyzing the past becomes really crucial to the party at that point in in the legitimacy of the leader. Maybe we can jump into that a bit more with Xi a little bit later, but for now, I'm just curious, what effect do you think that had in the the immediate period in 1949 and through the 50s, right after they, they took power? Well, I think initially what it did was it developed a narrative to give legitimacy to the Communist Party, to its existence, to why it was struggling against the nationalists, why it was struggling against the Japanese who had invaded. And the correct telling of history from then on always played an important part in Chinese Communist Party legitimacy to rule. So as it began to take power uh, increasingly through the late 1940s, and then, of course, ultimate power in 1949, it came presenting itself as the victors over adversity. It was the group that had defeated the Japanese, although that wasn't actually the case. The the nationalists had played a far greater role in that struggle. But also it was going to liberate China from the rapacious hands of landlords and of the foreign forces. And it was going to give back to China its respect, uh, restore the sovereignty of the nation. And that, I think, for many people in the early 50s, at least, was supportive of that view. You remember, China had just come through 30-odd years of internal strife, civil war, war with the Japanese, there was rampant inflation, the economy was in the mess. And I think a group taking power that seemed to be competent, that was going to provide stability, and had a compelling story and narrative about why they were justified in their rule, I think initially did appeal to many people. And those who had doubts, I think, were willing to shelve those doubts to see how things would turn out under the new regime. I want to take a step back for a second from the the story of the CCP and, and, and ask you about some of your own research for this book and the theme 
sort of that we've been touching on of official histories comes up a lot. I'm curious, how, how difficult is it to try to research a book like this? And are there any particular periods where it's easier to find documentation or references to? Yes, I mean, it has depended on time. You know, I, I was first a student in China back in the uh, mid-70s, towards the end of the Cultural Revolution. And of course, you couldn't do anything in terms of serious research then. But in the 1980s, when I was able to do a fair amount of research on the period before 1949, it was easier to access uh, libraries in China. It was easier to interview participants. It was easier to even access some of the archival materials. And that, of course, in the current period of time has become almost impossible. So there's a kind of a flow uh, over the last two or three decades when Research sometimes was more feasible, more possible, and other periods of time when it was just much more difficult. In terms of uh, access of materials, again, a lot of these materials are actually outside of China or have been collected outside of China. So since the um, Soviet archives opened up on China, there was a whole data trove uh, of information about the relationship between China and the Comintern, and that is readily accessible these days. And of course, in the Cultural Revolution, which is impossible to research in China nowadays, during the Cultural Revolution, as the whole system broke down, a lot of information was uh, put out, was published, was disseminated, and much of that was uh, collected in Hong Kong and other centers and so, again, much of that material is readily available. As you move into the reform period, the 1980s, you could talk easily to people about reform, as in the 90s. But as we got to the turn of the century, I found it tougher and tougher to get really uh, useful interviews with people. You might kind of get bland statements, but to really get people to express a range of critical views was becoming increasingly difficult. And then you had to rely more on the um, traditional arts of stargazing, looking at tea leaves and guesswork to try and get you through. Right, right. Well, that sounds pretty, pretty difficult. Just sort of going back to the, to the history of the CCP, in terms of the Cultural Revolution, you write that, that the Cultural Revolution is, and I'm quoting from the book here, the most complicated and misinterpreted event in the history of the PRC. Hmm. Why is that? Well, why it was the most misinterpreted was, I think, because of China's own propaganda and view about it, that somehow it was a struggle between two lines. And what they mean by that, basically two different groups within the party with opposing visions about the way forward. One group under Mao, who was going to lead China forward to the communist Nirvana, and another group under the then president, Liu Shaoqi, who was going to take it backwards to some kind of Soviet revisionism and take it back down a capitalist road. And that, I think, influenced a lot of the early writing about the Cultural Revolution, particularly when we didn't have access to some of the materials yet and to many of the protagonists in the Cultural Revolution, that people tend to look for that elite struggle that was taking place. But what was also encompassed in that was really a, a bursting out of frustrations amongst the general populace that had been building up from the 50s into the 60s. You know, workers were unset about, upset about the increasing control in the factories. Farmers who'd been given back land and then had it taken away during the movement towards communization had also been extremely frustrated. And whenever they were given any freedom of choice, they preferred to go back to household farming. And so we actually really had during the Cultural Revolution, yes, a power struggle at the top, that is true, but also a whole set of social conflicts within society that began to be played out uh, during the period of the Cultural Revolution. And it was an extraordinary period. Central administration and control collapsed. The nation as a whole was in chaos. Red guards were roaming around the countryside. 
uh, and through the urban areas. And many people were getting to see for the first time the realities of life in China. You know, people in urban China, students had been fed the line that they were moving towards a communist nirvana. Uh, then they went to the countryside on their travels, and many of them saw the poverty uh, that still existed in the countryside. And it led to really a very significant breakdown on the behalf of many in terms of trust in the party and what the party was saying and doing. So after that period or sort of towards the tail end there, the, the PLA, the, the military, comes in and restores order. How did, how did that period affect the party's relationship to the military? Well, the problem was that the party really had disintegrated because of Mao's attacks on it. The state administration has essentially uh, stopped functioning. So by 1969, even Mao accepted that really the country was being torn apart by the fighting which was taking place. And the only national organization that was left was the army. And so Mao turned to the army to restore order, to bring back some semblance of, a control, of control over the chaotic situation that had unfolded. And if you look at the administration through the early part of the 1970s, uh, they set up a body at the provincial level, other levels of government called a revolutionary committee. And most of those, if not all, were dominated by military leaders and military figures. So it created a stress between the maxim that the party controls the gun and the fact that really the gun was in control of much of the country at large. And that was a situation which Mao and his supporters were uncomfortable with and did not um, want to persist for too long. And so then we see uh, the purge of the defense minister and supposedly Mao's named successor, Lin Biao, being purged and many of those around him also being uh, removed from power at the same time as the party tries to restore its credibility and tries to restore its oversight through the system. But it really took a good decade to be able to work that through to any kind of uh, solution that really had the party administration effectively back in control. So jumping ahead just a little bit, a little bit more, when the big reforms of the 1980s under Deng Xiaoping start being implemented, how did the party try to maintain political continuity with the Mao years and sort of the, the latter half of the 1970s? It was obviously a huge problem for them uh, because the Cultural Revolution and the Great Leap Forward and the devastation that had come through those two movements was so closely associated with Mao. But unlike in the Soviet Union, where if you got rid of Stalin, you still had Lenin, you know, Mao was the Lenin and the Stalin for the Chinese Communist Party. So you couldn't do away with him entirely. Let me just jump in here for our listeners sure. who might not who might not understand. So after Joseph Stalin is removed, right, the party tell, in the Soviet Union tells itself, well, we got rid of Stalin, but we still have the ideals of Lenin. Is that sort of the idea? Yes, that that's right. Him? I mean, the Soviet Union could undergo de-Stalinization, which they did in the, in the mid-1950s. And as you rightly said, they, they referred back to the appeal of Lenin, a Leninist party, Leninism, as a legitimizing device. The Chinese Communist Party couldn't do that because if you took away Mao, what did you have? Uh, you didn't have another figure that could substitute. So they wove a narrative which had to accept uh, at that point in time that Mao was culpable of excesses without uh, removing his credibility and authority entirely. So basically, it was a group of people around him, including his widow and others uh, close to his widow, the so-called Gang of Four, who were essentially uh, blamed for the excesses of the Cultural Revolution and were criticized for duping Mao in some ways, for pursuing the more radical policies and that they really had led China astray, and that Mao in his elderly years had gone along with some of that, but was also uh, aware enough that they were not to be trusted. And I think at that point, 
many people didn't want to look at that area too critically. They just wanted to get on. They wanted to try and rebuild things. And it was quite remarkable because I think the reforms that then were carried out in the 1980s could not have happened really without the Cultural Revolution. And what I mean by that is that people had been so shocked and so shaken by the ripping apart, the shredding of the institutional fabric and what happened once those institutions were removed, the chaos, the violence, the killings and so forth, that they really wanted to look forward and were willing to explore a whole range of alternatives uh, about the path that China might take through the 1980s. So after the implementation of those reforms and throughout the 80s, what debates were occurring within the CCP leading up to the Tiananmen protests? Well, initially reform went well. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Living standards increased for many. I think people felt that there was a, a commitment to the nation to build, to move forward. But really, by the mid 1980s, tensions were beginning to appear between a more open economic system and a political system which still really had exerted control and really was frustrating the kind of dynamism and institutional innovation that might be necessary to move things forward. And then I think different groups were frustrated with different things. The farmers, many of whom had been the initial beneficiaries of the reforms in the early 80s, were getting frustrated because the state was reasserting control over uh, taxes, grain production, and so forth, and their incomes were beginning to slow. Urban workers, certainly uh, once the Chinese leadership experimented with price reform, became very frustrated at the take of uh, inflation in the urban areas. Official statistics were maybe around about 30%, but I think uh, in reality they were probably much higher. You know, friends of mine would show me a packet of washing powder and I'd say, oh, it's roughly the same price. And they'd say, yeah, but look, it's half the size from what it was last year. And so there was that sort of uncertainty uh, in the economy about what was happening with inflation, what was happening with prices. And you had a kind of half-reformed system. Students, of course, began to push as China was opening up for more uh, freedom, the ability to be more critical, more intellectual debate. And they had been very frustrated in the mid-1980s when there had been some student-led demonstrations. Uh, which had been thwarted and had led to the dismissal of the then party secretary with his critics feeling he'd been too liberal, too open to some of these ideas. And then overriding all of this, many, many people were frustrated with what they saw as the corruption that was taking place in China and the way that officials were getting special benefits, special deals, beginning to ride around in foreign cars while many others were still struggling to make two ends meet uh, for a decent living. And so those were sort of, if you like, longer term frustrations that really only needed a spark to set them off. And that spark, of course, came when the party secretary who'd been dismissed in the mid-1980s died of a heart attack. And uh, students wanted to demonstrate his memory and were stopped from doing so by the authorities. And it eventually led to an outpouring of many of these emotions, not just amongst the students, but amongst the citizens of Beijing and across the country about the frustrations uh, that citizens uh, were seeing with the way the system was operating. And as we all know, that led to the protests, uh, the huge protest movements of uh, the summer of spring and summer of 1989. 
Right now, our lives are on our phones. And with our phones full of live-streamed exercise classes, midday work calls, and nightly family video calls, there's no room for fraud calls. Thankfully, AT&T makes customer security a priority, helping block those pesky calls. It's not complicated. AT&T Active Armor, 24-7 proactive network security and fraud call blocking to help stop threats at no extra charge. Compatible device slash service required. Visit att.com slash active armor for details. Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting for creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast for the stories. You trust podcast hosts like me for a lot of things, for the content you consume, for the news, even for information about national security and law. But you shouldn't have to trust us about sleep, which impacts your life very directly. So if you're looking for ways to improve your sleep this fall, don't just take it from me. You should also trust the more than 2 million happy sleepers who are currently sleeping on a Nectar mattress. There are tens of thousands of reviews from real people who sleep on Nectar mattresses that you can read. Nectar is an incredible value for a quality product. A mattress this well-engineered and comfortable should cost hundreds of dollars more, but Nectar prices start at just $499. Join the more than 2 million happy sleepers who sleep on a Nectar with its award-winning layers of comfort and premium memory foam mattress that hugs your body and keeps you cool. Nectar is currently running its biggest offer ever, $399 in accessories. Visit Nectarsleep.com to get your new mattress today. You get a 365-night home trial, plus forever warranty, plus free shipping and returns, Shop from the convenience of your own home. Go to Nectarsleep.com. That's Nectarsleep.com. Right. I want to touch on, you mentioned corruption there for a second. In the 90s, Jiang Zemin lets private entrepreneurs become party members. I'm curious what the impact of that was, especially with regards to corruption. Well, there's different types of private entrepreneurs. And I think one of the things that Jiang Zemin recognized in a positive sense was that the old adage that the party was a party just of workers and peasants bore no resemblance to reality any longer. There was a growing middle class, there was a very strong private enterprise sector, and somehow they had to be given a stake in the system if you didn't want them to attack from outside. And so he opened up the possibility of membership to those private entrepreneurs. Where the corruption comes in is really for those private entrepreneurs who made their wealth through their political connections to the local party leadership and even national party leadership, that they got uh, special favors, for example, in terms of loans. They got special favor in terms of access to land. They got special favor in terms of pricing of goods. And that was what caused a lot of uh, frustration and continued frustration through the 90s and beyond. So if you look at the the number of millionaires in China, a very high percentage, 90 plus percent, are party members. And it's certainly the relationship to the party which enabled them to develop their own economic uh, power. And often they were interchangeable. You know, one year the party secretary would be running the locality. Maybe the next year that party secretary had stepped down and he was running one of the profitable businesses in that particular town. So that kind of collusion really began to grow stronger and more lucrative as the late 1990s war on and into the turn of the century. On that note, I was wondering if you could just detail sort of the public frustration in some cases with children of high officials or or party members. Yes. I mean, I think the frustration really comes at two levels. At one level, it was just paying for things that should have been 
your natural right to access. So, for example, you go to the hospital. You know, you should be able to see the doctor immediately. But someone asks you for a few yuan tip to maybe speed you up in the queue. You know, you want access to materials in a cupboard, which happened to me. You know, I had to pay, first of all, the person to go and find the person who had the keys. Then I had to pay the person who had the keys. Then I had to pay that person more for them to open the cupboard. Then I had to pay some money for someone else to take the materials out of the cupboard. Well, okay, that's fine for me as a foreigner. But for many Chinese, that was everyday life. So there was that kind of bubbling frustration at a lower level. And then what do they look and see? Well, you know, they see the children of very senior officials riding around in very expensive cars, getting into uh, lucrative business uh, engagements, often with foreigners, or they're beginning to get into the financial sector. You know, they're enjoying uh, privileged access to goods. They're uh, getting foreign holidays. And they're beginning to sort of live a life which everybody knows has come about because of their political connections through their family rather than to their own endeavors and their hard work. Let's talk about one famous child of formerly very senior party officials, uh, Xi Jinping. He didn't necessarily fall into that category that you just mentioned Mm. of riding around in expensive cars. But I was wondering if you could talk about sort of how he's tried to sort of revive the image of the the party officials' princelings, as you call them. Yes. I mean, as you say, he is a princeling himself. And in fact, back in the late 1990s, when there was a, a vote for um, uh, Central Committee members, he actually received the lowest vote, which was in part a pushback against these princelings and people being frustrated. And then 10 years later, he's sort of emerging as the heir apparent. And that in part was because he did keep himself clean. He is not tainted with that kind of exaggerated behavior that some of the other children of leaders were suspected of engaging in. And certainly when he began formally to take power across 2012 and 2013, I think he looked around and thought, this place looks a mess. You know, there had just been an inter-party struggle for who actually would be the leader of China. And one other princeling was purged in that process, removed from uh, power. Corruption was uh, rampant, as we had just been talking about. Society seemed to be slipping out of control. There were lots of heterogeneous liberal ideas circulating in society. And uh, local government, was pursuing its own interests, often at the expense of the interests of the national government. And so I think as he looked around, he thought, you know, this really needs a strong, tough, unified party to get this uh, system back under control. And of course, he started off with one of the most popular issues, a major campaign against corruption, uh, which found resonance. And initially, Many people saw this as just a way to get rid of his uh, enemies and his possible opponents. And some of that is true. But over time, it's quite clear that it's spread into a much broader uh, movement to eradicate some of the most egregious forms uh, of corruption that have been taking place. And as a result of that, it began to build some popular sympathy and support for Xi's leadership. So a lot of people, aside from the anti-corruption reforms, a lot of people have been debating in the United States in public recently whether or not she is a, has successfully reformed a lot of the Chinese government's policies. But I want to talk about his reform within the CCP. How significantly has he concentrated power compared to his immediate predecessors? Well, as far as we know, and of course we are dealing with the proverbial black box here, we have to admit that we don't know an awful lot about what really goes on. But as far as we can see, it's been remarkable how quickly he established his authority and how uh, strongly he has centralized uh, decision-making and power in his own hands. I don't think anybody inside of China or outside of China thought that he would be able to move so swiftly 
to shift away from the kind of collective leadership that had developed over the previous uh, 15 years or so to a much more centralized, rigid system focused around the general secretary as the key leader or as the core, as they refer to him in Chinese parlance. And that, I think, took everybody by surprise. And also his illiberal attitude. His father, you talked about him earlier, being one of these princelings, his father was known as a very liberal figure and had been responsible for many of the progressive reforms in the south of China. Xi himself had worked in uh, provinces along the Chinese coast, which uh, had a much uh, greater role for private business, for example. And yet when he took power, he didn't move in a liberal direction. He moved back in a much more conservative direction. And I think it was because of his fear that unless there was that unified, tough, disciplined party with a key leader, uh, things could slip very quickly out of control. So I want to return for a second, and this might seem like it's not connected, but in a, in a way it is, to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And in the mm. book, you write that that a lot of the party is really obsessed with the collapse of the Soviet Union. It makes a lot of sense. They were essentially mm. their closest peer nation in terms of governance structure. What is Xi's interpretation of the collapse of the Soviet Union, and how has that affected the way that he's really ruled since 2013? Mm. You know, when I was in China in the early 1990s, many people I knew, who I knew, including reasonably senior Communist Party officials, really did believe they would be next. They really thought that the demise of the Soviet Communist Party and then what began to unfold in Central Asia and uh, parts of Eastern Europe really heralded uh, a massive problem for them and that you know, collapse was quite possible. So I use that as an example to say this really did have a jarring effect on many people. And it certainly had a huge impact on Xi Jinping. He refers to it uh, frequently in speeches. And he refers to the fact that, you know, he talks about the fact that no one stood up when it was necessary. No one stood up to defend the principles of Marxism, to defend the principles of the Communist Party. And as a result, the system imploded. And of course, he hates Gorbachev for the role that he thinks Gorbachev, the then Soviet leader, played in that process. And he sees that uh, as a result, uh, the Soviet Union, now Russia, of course, has just been in relative decline ever since. And that has really reaffirmed his belief that you have to stand up, you have to be strong, you have to reassert the primacy of the Chinese Communist Party, because if you don't do that, things could unravel and could go away very, very quickly. So I think it's very instrumental in informing his view of what should happen in China and his view of the world, that the people outside of China are continually looking to undermine the Communist Party. They want to engage in yet another color revolution to be able to cause the Chinese Communist Party to collapse. So along political lines and not necessarily strict government policy, in the book you describe Xi's attempts to derive legitimacy from China's imperial past and also his his sort of mandate that party members study Marxism. How how are these two things not necessarily incompatible? <laughs> it's a puzzling question, no doubt about it. I think we have to take Xi Jinping seriously that he thinks he is a Marxist. And certainly he pushes ideas of historical materialism. He seems to think that there is a trajectory of history, which inevitably means that China is rising while the West is failing. But I think he also realizes that is not enough. And so he does cast himself now and the Chinese Communist Party as the inheritors of all that was good in the Chinese imperial past. Now, that does sound strange to one's ears, and it sounds very strange to mine, because when I was a student in China in the Cultural Revolution, there was a huge criticized Confucius campaign going on. The argument then was it's all that traditional culture which is uh, holding China back. 
you have to smash the Confucian shop, as it was said. And now here we have uh, China's uh, Marxist leader really paying greater praise uh, to Confucius than any of the Communist Party leaders before him. And I think it's part of this broadening the scope of legitimacy by appealing into a long train of history that many people in China look to, are supportive of. And now here we have a situation where, yes, the Communist Party is Marxist, but it also inherits fine traditions from the past. Of, And of course, they're a caricature of the past about uh, the need for authority, uh, the need to obey, uh, the need to be moral, the need to follow certain principles. Of course, it doesn't talk about the Confucian issues of the right to rebel if your leaders are mistreating you. And so I think it's part of that attempt to try and fuse together what he sees as the new with a respect for, for China's long tradition of rule. And of course, remember, it's been ruled by an emperor for most of that time. Let's talk a little bit about his policies, particularly the prioritization of, of distribution over growth. Do you think that at all connects to Xi's Marxist tendencies? I think it does. You know, for a period of time, much of the policy has been very laissez-faire towards who makes wealth, uh, who controls that wealth, and how do they use that wealth. And it has created uh, friction with society. If you look at what people are upset by, it's usually one of three things, inequality, corruption, or environmental pollution. And increasingly over time, there have been jarring images of the uh, inequalities in China. And that, I think, has hit a vein of people's concern. And I think as a result, Xi Jinping, uh, claiming that China is still socialist, it's a socialist party, you know, he feels that there has to be uh, a fairer distribution of income. And we've seen targets among some of the wealthier people in China, some of the entertainers in China who've not been paying taxes, which is an old refrain. Back in the 90s, when Zhu Rongji was premier, he was apparently outraged when he found that he was paying more taxes than one of uh, China's most famous film stars. So it is something that has caused irritation. It's something that is talked about a lot in social media in China and is beginning I think, to find uh, support uh, from society for actions to restrict uh, the inequalities. Now, the extent to which they can and will do that, I think, is still open for debate. One of the most interesting things to observe would be if they actually brought in a property tax. And they've tried this for 10 years now and never really been able to do it, in part because the middle classes don't want to pay a property tax but also because local officials don't want to disclose that they might own three or four apartments and therefore would be exposed when they had to pay the property tax on it. So it keeps getting delayed. So there are limits to how far he can push this redistribution. But I think it speaks to his core belief that China should be a socialist country. And one more, more recent development is the crackdown on the tech sector. Early in the book, you write that what's really important to the, the CCP is not necessarily full popular sport, but the acquiescence of key groups to CCP control. Does, does this recent crackdown on the tech sector sort of fit into that? Yeah, I think it's uh, a warning that the party stays in control and you are creatures of the party and the party's creation and don't forget that. I think it, though, speaks to two broader issues. One is that the, the party has always been suspicious uh, of the private sector. You know, when it was founded in 1921, it was going to eradicate it. And it did eradicate it in the 1950s. It destroyed completely the private sector. And then as the 80s went on, of course, slowly the private sector began to play a more important role. As we talked about earlier, uh, Jiang Zemin legitimized it by allowing those private entrepreneurs to join the party. And now it accounts for something like 60% of GDP, 80 to 90% of employment. So you can't wish it away. 
But what you can do is be very suspicious of it and make sure you keep it under control. So we see increasingly the reassertion of the party secretary's role in private businesses, of the party committee taking over final decision making from the more technical side. So I think that's one dimension. I think there's a second dimension, though, is that when the party lacks the capacity to develop something, it outsources. And it'll either outsource it to society or it'll outsource it to the foreigners. And I think we've seen that with the influx of foreign technology and the development of the tech sector, which has been independent, really, of state control and party control. And now that it's grown to a certain level, that it controls more data than the Communist Party itself and might be seen as a threat to the Communist Party in that sense, although I don't think it really is, then you see, as before in history, the party moves to pull it back in again, to rein it back in and to reassert its control over the sector. And you see things where, you know, state-owned enterprises begin to take a stake in successful private businesses and so forth. So one area where China has tried to, like you said, sort of export different things would be its dirty industries. Uh, It seems like there's been a recent trend towards China taking more of its polluting manufacturing, trying to move that outside of China. Has she been successful in trying to curb some environmental damage? Well, certainly for a while, there was the phrase green at home and black abroad. And as you correctly said, while China was trying to shut down some of its um, most polluting industries, it was building them in other countries. And its defense always was, well, it's not us doing it. This is what the country wants. This is where their technological level is. That's what they need. Well, that doesn't play too well. And I think it's come back to haunt the leadership in Beijing. So if you see more recent meetings, you know, Xi Jinping and others have been more modest about their objectives uh, overseas with respect to, to industry and development and has been saying that they want to not build any more dirty coal plants and so forth. But one thing we have to remember is, despite what I've been saying earlier, China is still a very decentralized country with a lot of different interests. And some of those dirty industries have been probably pushed by the companies themselves rather than the government. And then it takes a while for the government to find out what is taking place and, again, to be able to pull back from the negative consequences for that. At home, it has uh, introduced actually very good sets of environmental regulations. But here we come to another problem in the Chinese uh, system. It's up to the local government to implement those regulations. And often it's not been in the interest of the local government to apply them because perhaps the dirty industry is the main uh, contributor of income to the local government. So it doesn't want to shut it down. Or what it'll do is it'll keep fining it continually to just generate revenue for the local government. So while I have you here, I have to ask you about something that just uh, came out this week, which was uh, China's video game ban for <laughs> for kids uh, under the age of 18. I'm sorry, I had to ask you. Um, <laughs> So for those listening who might not know, China, I think, limited it to three hours of video games per week for people under the age of 18. And only on weekends. And uh, yeah, on, those three hours are only to be spent on the weekends. I've seen some online commentators that have said, well, this is just a great way to teach a young generation how to get around party controls. I'm interested <laughs> in if you share that view or what your whole perception is of, of this. Well, I guess I wish that when my kids were younger, perhaps there'd been a similar regulation about their number of hours spent gaming. But um, I think um, what you just said is true. There's There's a very common saying in China, they have their measures and we have our countermeasures. And there's another one, you know, the hills are high and the emperor is far away. And You know, many Chinese people, and I suspect many Chinese teenagers, are incredibly inventive. And what I've seen is, over time, every time a new regulation comes in, people spend a lot of energy finding their way around it. 
And I would think that that is happening. We already have reports that it, it's happening, you know, using fake names, using getarounds, getting runarounds and so forth. But the tech companies themselves are really under pressure to try and ensure this. And I saw that Tencent was using some facial recognition technologies uh, that would be able to shut down uh, access for players uh, if they were breaching these regulations. You know, how this goes, who knows? I mean, it's uh, it's almost impossible to think that it can have that amount of control that it can stop under 18s from finding a way to play more video games. You know, it was, you know, some years ago when there were instructions for certain categories of people only to have one car. Well, they got, you know, the uncle bought a car, you know, the cousin bought a car, which they drove. And then as I suggested to somebody about where they could and couldn't drive, you know, one thing you could do is you could just buy different sets of number plates, which might be a cheaper way to get around it, which they did. And they were quite happy with that. So there's a whole cat and mouse game that's going to be interesting to watch. And and I think there, to bring it back to one of the earlier points you were talking about, is the party has a lot of trouble dealing and controlling with its online communities. And, you know, inevitably, some of the kids and some of the others playing around online are going to be smarter than any government hacker or any government controller. And they will find ways around. And let me just give one quick example that there was a period when they were trying to, and they still do, control the use of certain phrases and certain languages at particular times. But government agencies were only working nine to six. So between nine and six, you saw a lot of control. And then after six o'clock at night, you saw the controls just lapsing because they'd all gone home. So I don't know now whether they have a sort of three shift system. So they're still working in the evenings or not. But it shows that that control can never be complete. So my last question for you on a somewhat similar note is that one consistent theme throughout the book seems to be the law of unintended consequences. Yeah. Whenever the CCP tries to implement a policy, classic example of this being the one child policy, the party implements a policy or the government implements a policy and down the line, the country is facing a demographic problem. As China watchers look to the future, what challenges and potential unintended consequences do you do you think people should look out for? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think it's important for decision makers in Washington that tend to sort of extrapolate things as linear. And that because China says it's going to do something, it will do it. Uh, you know, looking back over the history, it's very rarely fulfilled its plans and very rarely meets properly its objectives. And as you said, it often has unintended consequences. So I think if we look forward, I think there's a number of areas which will be really important to look at. One is, as you said, the unintended demographic consequences of the one-child policy. What is that going to do in terms of demand on the state for healthcare resources, for social welfare infrastructure? I think there's going to become competition for resources between building up the military and shoring up the social security systems. I think a second area is, you know, can China really, with the increased state control, produce a vibrant economy that can keep growing at sufficient strength to keep moving people out of poverty and to keep its growing middle class happy? And for that, it's going to have to rely very heavily on innovation and innovation in the private sector. And yet, a lot of what we were talking about earlier with the crackdown on that sector would seem to indicate that innovation is going to be tougher in that sector. So is there an unintended consequence there? And perhaps the final thing I'll just conclude with, there would be many other examples, is in the political sphere. Is Recentralization of control and decision making effectively in the hands of one person 
what China needs in the current age. Does an increasingly sophisticated, an increasingly diverse, an increasingly heterogeneous uh, society need one person who makes all the key and core decisions? Or can that lead to some disastrous errors and mistakes? And does, by concentrating the power in that person who seems to insist that they want to stay beyond their two terms as president, and perhaps stay for many more years beyond that, does that create ultimately a political instability and problems of leadership transition down the road that no one had thought of and would be another unintended consequence of this concentration of power? We're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please share the Lawfare Podcast and give us a five-star review on iTunes. Go to thelawfarestore.com for brand new Lawfare pens, lanyards, t-shirts, and socks. The podcast is produced and edited by Jen Patia Howell, and your audio engineer is Hamza Shetu of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening. Hi, it's Rachel Fisher from the Hollywood Crime Scene Podcast, and I'm here to talk to you about Shudder. Shudder is the ultimate streaming service for fans of horror, thrillers, and the supernatural. Shudder offers an unbeatable selection from Hollywood favorites like Halloween and cult classics like one of my personal favorites, Chopping Mall, to original series like Creepshow and The Last Drive-In with Joe Bob Briggs. Check out critically acclaimed new genre films that you won't find anywhere else all uncut and commercial free. If you're a horror fan like me or just looking for new content to stream, Shudder is a must-have subscription. Sign up and subscribe to Shudder.